Uh, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Andri. I am a DevOps engineer in AWS cluster COE here in SoftServe. I'm a certified SysOps administrator and uh, working with AWS services for about a year. Uh, today, I'd like to share my experience in the implementing AWS Cognito in real project. Obviously, developing a user management system uh, is not an easy task. It requires careful planning, decent amount of resources and time. There are a lot of frameworks that could be used, but uh, I believe there is no uh, silver bullet in this field. AWS Cognito is not an exception. While it does work great, there are several caveats that must be taken into account. On this slide, you, you can see uh, today's agenda. First of all, I provide some basic information about Cognito service and its features. Then I'll show you our implementation and we discuss some problems that can arise. Of course, I've prepared a short demo. Hope you enjoyed it. And the Q&A session in the end. So let's start. Uh, so what is Cognito? In short, Cognito is an AWS fully management service that provides authentication, authorization, and user management for your web and mobile apps. It was launched on July 10th in 2014 and remains active till these days. Cognito is a region service, so its infrastructure is distributed and thus is reliable enough to handle some unexpected outages. Cognito is available in 12 regions plus one region of government cloud. Cognito SLA is triple nine with possible credit refund if problem occurs. Cognito is compliant with ISO, PCI, HIPAA, High Trust, and uh, GDPR ready based on AWS reports. Cognito consists of two main parts, user pools and identity pools. There is also a Cognito sync, but basically it's just a use case of user pools. User pool is a directory in Amazon Cognito. With its help, your users can sign in to your web or mobile application through Amazon Cognito. Your users can also sign in through social identity providers like Google or Facebook or through SAML identity providers. With are your users signing directly or through a third party, all members of the user pool have a directory profile that you can access through SDK. Other important features are uh, a built-in customizable web UI to sign in your users, security features such as multi-factor authentication, checks for compromised credentials, account takeover protection, and phone and email verification. You can also customize workflows and use, uh, you perform user migration through AWS Lambda triggers. Amazon Cognito Identity Pool Federated Identities enable you to create unique identities for your users and federate them with identity providers. With the Identity Pool, you can obtain temporarily limited privilege credentials to access other AWS services. Amazon Cognito Identity Pools support the following providers, like public providers, Amazon, Facebook, Google, or even Apple, Amazon Cognito User Pools, obviously, uh, and uh, OpenID and SAML Identity Providers. Uh, user Pool and Identity Pool can work together or completely independently. Here are the schemes of the basic flows. After successful authentication, Cognito returns user pool tokens to your app. You can use these tokens to grant your user access to your own server-side resources, or you can exchange them for temporary credentials to access other AWS services. Amazon Cognito user pool implements ID, access, and refresh tokens as defined by OpenID standard. The ID token contains claims about uh, the identity of the authenticated users. The access token contains scopes and user groups and is used to grant access to resources. 
The refresh token contains the information necessary to obtain a new ID or access token. Here you can see an example of JWT token and its decoded values. All tokens are signed. If you send these tokens to your backend application, make sure that before granting any access, they will be verified. Access and ID tokens expire within one hour. This parameter cannot be changed. Expired token can have expiration time from one to 3,650 days. Here is a caveat. The global sign out epicall revokes all tokens except the ID token. The ID token is a beer token that is generally used with services outside of user pools. Since API gateway checks even ID token, there is a possibility for user to gain access to resources even after user was signed out or even removed from user pool. Some logic must be implemented in front-end application to handle this case and block access for users with revoked tokens. Few words about pricing model. A user pool charges you for monthly active user or may you with free tier available except for government cloud. Free tier includes 50,000 MAUs, and after that you will be charged per new mail per calendar month. A user is counted as monthly active user if within a calendar month there is identity operation related to that user. For example, sign up, sign in, uh, token refresh, or even password change. You are not charged for subsequent sessions for this user or for inactive users. Identity pools is free of charge. Uh, now let's find out how we implemented Cognito into our project. Our basic scheme. Here we have a static React based front end application that is deployed to S3 and available via CloudFront distribution. JavaScript makes API calls to backend application. API Gateway receives requests and proxies them to ECS cluster via private link. But this scheme lacks of authentication and authorization components. Every user has access to every part of application. And now the Cognita takes the stage. Everything is still straightforward. GS makes calls to Cognito and performs user authentication. Uh, since we have custom flow, we've decided to disable Cognito UI and use our own. When tokens are received, GS sends request to API Gateway. API Gateway validates token and pass this request to the backend. In case if token is outdated or is not present at all, an error is sent back to the GS. We don't have any sign-up functions. Instead, new users are added by admin staff. That's why ECS task is allowed to assume role that grants access to admin API calls to Cognito. Uh, Cognito user pool setup process is quite simple. However, I would like to share my thoughts about some particular topics. Just to mention briefly, uh, Cognita allows you to select password requirements, uh, choose account recovery policy, and uh, enable uh, multi-factor authentication. Required MFA must be selected before pool provisioning. After that, you will be able to select only MFA optional value. Of course, uh, Cognita also provides you a way to forbid sign-up procedure at all. Don't forget that if you write your own UI, you must cover all selected cases with it. By default, Cognito expects that every user will have unique username to sign in. However, you can slightly change this behavior. First of all, you can use aliases, verified email or phone or preferred username. So basically user is able to sign in using one of these four, including basic, basic usernames, identities. Email and phone can be either verified or non-verified. Verification can be performed by sending user an email or SMS with a verification code. 
when an admin creates user, he or she can mark both these fields as verified. For our project, we use different approach. A mail is used instead of username as a unique identifier. Cognito supports this case with this. But in fact, users still receive unique UID. Pay attention to case insensitivity. Amazon recommends always enable this feature. Changing one of these case settings will cause pool recreation. So sign-in scheme must be considered first. Cognita allows you to store information about your users. Information is encrypted by Cognita at rest. As you can see, there are a lot of different parameters. These are implementing following OpenID Connect specification. You can mark attributes as required and a user will not be allowed to reduce, register until attribute is filled. Also, Cognita supports up to 25 custom attributes. Using the console, you can add only attributes of number and string types. Using API, you can select daytime and Boolean types as well. And here I should mention cr crucial thing. For existing user pool, you can add a new custom attribute via console, but cannot edit or delete existing one. Moreover, there is an actual bug for AWS provider in Terraform. Even if you add new attribute, the pool is replaced. I suggest to add necessary attributes before creating user pool. You will have a much less headache later. Despite Cognito provides you with its own way to send emails, it is better idea to use more suitable services like SES, for example. If you want to use Cognito sending capabilities, just know that you will face a limit of 50 messages per day. You can use SES instead to overcome this limit. However, don't forget to remove your account from the sandbox. You are able to use both domain and email SES and identities. Cognito provides you a way also how to change the design for your reg registration and verification messages and SMS. You can use plain text or HTML, but you have to include special tags into your templates that will be replaced by username, temporary password, or verification code, depending on the message type. App clients. They dictate a way how your application will talk with Cognito. App client also gives you an access to the hosted UI to perform various authentication procedures. This UI is slightly customizable. Uh, you can create several clients to fit your needs. We don't use uh, generate client secret uh, since our auth process is very simple. However, uh, it should be used when uh, auth take place on the backend side and you have a reliable and more important secure storage for these secrets. Auth floats are very important. In our case, we are using simple username password authentication. Refresh token flow cannot be disabled at all. You can also select Lambda best flow when authentication is performed by your Lambda function. SRP flow is unique since it has slightly different scheme. It has better security level, but is a bit harder to implement. Admin flow is about Cognito administering. You can specify several flows, but when authentication procedure begins, your code must tell Cognito what flow it wants to use. If flow is unavailable, Cognito will respond with error. For every client, you can select two sets of attributes that can be readable or writable. Thus, you specify the attributes that will be available to users. You can consider this as user profile editing. And in the end, we have Lambda triggers. Uh, actually, we don't use them in our project, but still they are worth mentioning. Triggers help you to have a customized authentication flow. If you want to add challenges, perform some uh, post sign up actions, uh, they are the primary way to achieve these goals. Uh, so 
actually we are done with uh, user pool setup uh, and uh, there are several features that I want to mention also. I briefly talk about user rights that access token provides. In fact, uh, these roles are the user groups that pool allows you to create. Here we have three groups. User can be part of several groups and uh, then group precedence comes into play. Zero is a top precedence. If groups have same precedence value, there is a preferred option to help you resolve user effective rights in your application. But here I must mention other interesting approach to implement RBAC model. When you create user group, you are able to select IAM role for this group. IAM role describes permissions that user can assume to access various AWS resources. To implement these permissions, you should use Cognito Identity Pool, a component that allows you to exchange your JWG token to temporary AWS credentials. Identity Pool checks the token, finds your IAM role, and since you've passed authentication, gives you AWS credentials limited to early selected role. Sounds interesting, right? And uh, I'll show this uh, approach in the demo section as well. Let's talk about implementation. As I mentioned earlier, Cognita is tied with a API gateway in our project. First thing that you want to provision is API gateway after Riser. When request comes, API gateway looks for the same header as indicated in the token source field and checks, and checks it with Cognita. You can also specify regex in token validation to decline any invalid patterns before actual check. Next thing you should do is to add your authorizer to the method request. When request comes, API gateway match a resource and the method and then validates header with authorization token if authorizer was selected. We are using quite simple setup of API gateway since all requests must be proxied to the backend. However, as you can see, there is a separate options method. It leads us to course issue. Our front end and backend application use different domain names. To increase security with an interconnection between different domains, course policy exists in browsers. In fact, before sending actual request, browser sends a pre-flight check with options method. It waits to receive three access control headers, allow header, allow methods, allow origin. If there are no such header in response, browser blocks connection and you get a nice error in the console. There are three steps to overcome this issue. First, your backend application must return at least a low origin at all time. In this header, you must provide a list of allowed domains or the star symbol to allow them all. Second, our backend responds only to real methods like get, post, put, ATC. That's why API Gateway has a mock method of options that returns appropriate headers in response to pre-flight request. This method must not be covered with Cognita authorizer. Authorization header will be sent a bit later. Third, when you don't supply a token or token is invalid, API gateway responds with appropriate error. Your request does not reach a backend application at all. By default, response with such errors comes without any special header and that leads to course error as well. Recently, Amazon has added special structure to extend such responses with necessary headers or end response body. It's called gateway response. It is available via console and API as well. So you should add headers there too. Cognita integrates pretty easily into the API gateway and after many tests, we haven't found any other issues related to authentication process. I also would like to mention Cognita limits. Actually, there are plenty of them. There are hard and soft limits. 
Personally, I face it one of them. Our backend application extensively made calls to admin list groups for user Cognito API endpoint. This endpoint helps to determine what groups a user belongs to. This endpoint has a limit of 10 requests per second, and during performance test, this limit was quickly achieved. However, it's basically an issue with implementation. Frontend should send an access token to the backend. So we must then validate and use the token in the first place instead of making unnecessary calls to the API. Easy fix was applied and problem was solved. And in the end, uh, I want to share my thoughts about Cognito weak points. First of all, it takes some time to develop for developers to implement Cognito calls, especially if they didn't have a chance to work with it early. I'm talking about front-end part. Back-end part is relatively easy since your instance will probably have some IAM role with uh, allowed API calls. Front-end part is responsible for authentication. If you would like to use your own UI, your developers should not only recreate all flow by, but intercept any error that could potentially arise. Cognito provides a ready framework. In our case, it was GS, but still, there are a lot of moving parts that must be taken into consideration. Second, there are a lot of options that can cause user pool recreation, name, attributes, MFA. On the first iterations, your pool will be recreated a lot of times. When pool is removed, you lose all users that were in it. But if it sounds okay for developments, such changes in production pool will cause the hell. See, you are allowed to extract all information about your users except their password. As I mentioned, if you even use admin API to create user, you can provide only a temporary password. User will be asked to change it after first sign in. From one side, it's a huge security benefit. From other, full picture is not available to you. <clears throat> there are several approach to save your user between pool recreation. One of them is to save users uh, to the RDS, for example, especially when you add uh, users via backend application. It has security concerns since you are not responsible, uh, since you are now responsible to keep user data in secret. Of course, <clears throat> you can intercept password change and set new password to your database but honestly, it sounds like a big security breach. Other option is to use post-registration Lambda trigger and separate a user pool to replicate your new users into that pool. But again, in case of outage, users will be convinced to change their passwords and satisfaction will be harmed. Several months ago in AWS RSS feed, I saw an article about some sort of replic replication solution for user pools, but it was deleted afterwards. I have no doubts that Amazon will provide us with some reliable tool to handle such problems. However, we don't know when and barely know how. And it's demo time. Uh, first of all, I give you examples of tokens. Uh, then we will make some API calls using different afterizers. So, can you see the AWS console? Yeah. Okay. So, um, I want to show you um, users. Uh, I told that uh, even if I use email as, as my username, uh, the user still get the weird UID here. Uh, here are our groups. We have only one group for now. And um, this group uh, has an IAM role. We will use it in our demo. Actually, uh, here is a menu for uh, customization of built-in user interface. Actually, you can uh, change a lot of uh, CSS uh, related options, uh, but you can also upload some, some of your logo. Uh, the interface is 
quite simple and you can see it right here. So if you want to add some, uh, for example, uh, social logins, uh, they will be here, right here. And uh, what about, ah, one fact about API Gateway and Afterizer. Uh, here uh, I have uh, my Cognito Afterizer, and here you see a test button. Now, this button uh, actually helps you to uh, verify uh, your actions your, and your approach. And uh, when you get an ID token from Cognito, you can uh, pass it here, make some tests, and receive uh, every information that uh, this token has. It's a really cool feature. And uh, for today, I uh, made some infrastructure. Uh, we have um, API gateway with uh, three endpoints, the root endpoint, the Cognito endpoint, which covered by Cognito uh, authorization, uh, authentication. And um, here is the proxy endpoint that will uh, catch all other requests. Um, it has uh, IAM uh, authorization. So let me show you my demo script. It's written in Python. Uh, actually, there are two stages. Uh, in the first stage, uh, we will get ID token and test it. In the second stage, uh, we will receive uh, not only ID token, but uh, AWS credentials as well. Uh, I am using the um, standard calls. Uh, so, uh, for example, GS application will use um, the same calls to get uh, the same uh, tokens or whatever. And um, to test uh, everything, I uh, will use Postman. And uh, here we have our um, API endpoint. And uh, I can test it and it should return root. Yeah, so we now at root. Uh, the next things we will try to access Cognito, and uh, actually now I I need to get this token. So using here, yeah. So this is ID token uh, that uh, we should um, include in our authorization header uh, to pass actually Cognito authorization. Here's the postman. Here as a header. Here, boom and send request. Yep, we got the cognito. It's quite simple uh, way to, after, uh, to authorize your request and uh, we use in our project this method. Uh, the other method that uh, I would like to show you uh, is a combination of cognito user pools and identity pools. And the first step, we made the same call. We uh, call Cognito to receive ID token. And then we pass this ID token to um, identity pool to get AWS credentials. So we will call this right here. Boom. We have uh, access key ID, secret key, and session token all data to make uh, calls. So let's make one call. Here I have one more endpoint. And we add this data. So we got the response. Uh, we reached this endpoint. Uh, actually, uh, since uh, uh, we covered all other requests with IAM authorization, I would like to show one more thing. If we change this way, we, uh, I do have uh, the endpoint IAM2. Uh, and I uh, send a new request using um, these parameters. 
and I will get an error. Yeah, our request was denied because uh, we don't have uh, our role that we assumed uh, does not uh, provide us uh, an access to this endpoint. And here where you can see this, this is uh, the policy that grants access uh, to actually the user group. And here, as you can see, uh, the get and IEM. Here we specify a method and here we specify an endpoint. So actually our user is able to reach only uh, IEM endpoint with get method. Uh, and that, that way is a perfect way to uh, make really granular access to your API. So basically you can um, create a lot of policies uh, for get, post, put, and for every endpoint that you want and uh, create as many groups as you want. However, there is a limit or there are a lot of groups you can create. Uh, this sounds really cool, but actually, uh, this method of authorization uh, can be a pain for a front-end developer because uh, they should uh, track not only uh, regular Cognito tokens, for example, for expiration, for example, but they should track an AWS credentials for expiration. And even more, to make these calls, it's easy with Postman, but it's not easy with regular code you should sign your request with, um, for example, with special algorithm to uh, encode here, the access security and session tokens. <clears throat> it's a really unusual task. And uh, um, actually I, um, I didn't find any clear explanation how to do this. So it will take so uh, some time from uh, for uh, front-end developers to implement this behavior. But anyway, it uh, can be a huge benefit. For our, for our project, we decided to use um, a simple method because we don't have uh, enough, for example, resources time uh, to implement uh, this whole approach. So uh, basically that's all from my side. Um, if you have any questions, 